Good morning, everyone. It is so great to see you, Roseanne and I, who is my lovely wife. If you haven't met her, we came in uh, last night from San Antonio, Texas. Uh, but because San Antonio doesn't have a football team, I will let you know if you're a visitor that I actually pastor a pretty large church in Kansas City who does have a football team. And they're going to beat the, um, the Ravens uh, today, and then uh, we'll take you guys on from San Francisco and see how it all goes. At the end of the day, Jesus is Lord. Amen. Hey, so, hey, uh, I do three services in Kansas City, and then I immediately jump, Roseanne will tell you, in the car, uh, you know, it's all safe, and I jump online, and I catch the service here every single Sunday. I love it. And um, I have to tell you, from my point of view, is uh, God is doing something here. And sometimes you can get so, so close to something, you can't see it, but those of us who are a little bit further away we can see it, and I can feel it, particularly when, when Ben pans the camera back and I see the whole congregation, and I see this place filling up, and I see you worshiping the Lord. Um, there's something very special going on here, and I want to I wanna shout out a lot of people, but uh, can, I, can we get a shout out for Pastor Sam? Come on. I've, a lot of you have shared with me, and the team is building here. We got Jade. Let's give it up for Jade. She's an answer to prayer and our piano player. And let's not forget the person holding up the back wall, Leslie, back there. She's holding it up for us. She is awesome. And you'd say, so I'll be here 10 Sundays this year if you'll have me. And you, the answer to this question is, well, why in the world would you, you know, leave a big church and, and all of that to come here? And the answer is because I want to be a part of it. Because God's called me to be a part of it, and you guys said yes. So I want to say to you today, if you'll let me, I love my church. I love Yountville Community Church, and I'd like to teach it a word today, if that's okay. Is that all right? All right, let's pray. Father, today, I now ask that everyone would open their minds, and their hearts, and their hands for what you have for us today, and that we will commit, that we will walk out of here in the power of your Spirit, putting these things into place, because we know that you are leading us to a good place. And all of God's people said? Amen. So I'd like to start off by showing you arguably the four most famous paintings of all time. Now, without question, most people would put the Mona Lisa as painting number one. We're going to put the Mona Lisa up. Here we go. It's coming. It's coming. There, the Mona Lisa, painted by Leonardo da Vinci in 1503, uh, arguably the best painting in the world. The second uh, painting in the world, The Girl with the Pearl Earring, uh, by Johannes Veermann in 1665, I think it was. Now, the third most popular painting uh, in the world is debatable. I would kind of go with the creation of Adam, uh, with his Michael, 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 Devan, uh, Michael what's his name? Michael Angelo painted the same time as Leonardo da Vinci, by the way, but other people choose uh, The Starry Night. Yeah, The Starry Night by Vincent van Gogh, 1889. And then, without question, in my opinion, the fourth most famous painting in the world is called The, it's called the, it's called the Stingray, painted by my granddaughter. <laughs> These four paintings are called masterpieces. They're called masterpieces. The Mona Lisa is worth an estimated $700 million. The Starry Night worth an estimated $100 million. The Stingray, priceless. <laughs> but here's what I want to tell you. This is how God made you. This is how God sees you. And if you don't believe me, take a look at what he says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, just the very first sentence. We're going to put it up on the screen. Say it out loud with me. For we are God's masterpieces. There it is. Now, this is the word that the New Living Translation uh, 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 gave uh, to the word masterpieces. But other translations uh, choose to use a different word. Uh, and I don't think that the translations are capturing the depth that God went to to bring you to life and to put you on display. The King James Version translates the word uh, 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 
what is it, workmanship. The New International Version translates it handiwork. But again, I don't believe this is a good translation for the, Paul, the word that Paul actually chose. The word for work in the Greek, which is the language that Paul and the other New Testament writers wrote in, is the word ergon, where we get the word energy. But this is not the word that Paul chose. As it turns out, you are not a piece of work. Now, some of you are a piece of work, you know, but you're more than a piece of work. You are more than that. The word that Paul chose here is the word poiome, poiema, 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 poiema is the word that he chose, and it is a word that is referring more to an artist than to a handyman, to an artist more than a handyman. Um, the only other time that this word, poiema, is used in the New Testament is in Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, where um, it's referring to the work of God in creation and is looking at the work of God in creation, Genesis 1 and 2, like that of an artist. The six days of creation where God is separating light from darkness as he's creating the sky and the waters and the land and the sea and the fish and, and the birds and the animals and even us, you know, it's artistry. And it's that same kind of work that God did to make all of that is the same thing that he did to make you and me. As a matter of fact, the psalmist, you know, this is a popular passage of Scripture, really captures this. But, it, but I want to I go back um, and take a look at some of the, the artistry of God and what I think that Paul is getting at here. I th every morning and every evening, God starts with a blank canvas. I know we have some artists here. A blank canvas, and he paints, paints a sunrise or he paints a sunset. So uh, these are from my camera, so they're not as awesome as they could be. But the first one is from Kansas. Kansas has great sunrises and sunsets because it's so doggone flat. You can, see the, you can see the sky for miles. But here's one from Napa. Hey, let's not take Napa out. Does anybody recognize this pay, pay, picture? It's the backyard of Robert and Celeste Whites. I took it. Oh, if you could see it on my camera, it is unbelievable. You know, Kansas has nothing on Napa. Here's one I took from uh, Mexico. And if you could see the full painting, uh, you would see that that sky is actually reflecting off on the water below. But then sometimes God doesn't just create something beautiful. He sends us a message. Yeah, I took a picture of this one. This is from my camera. Take a look at the next one. And do you see what I see? There's an angel popping out of the cloud. Is it possibly an angel? I don't know. But I think that God that day wanted to send us a message. Psalm chapter 139. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. It's a beautiful passage of Scripture. But here in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is not so much just referring to how God formed us in the womb, as the psalmist is saying, but he's actually referring to something different. The passage goes on, for we are God's masterpieces. And here's the second line. Uh, let's put the second line up. Here we go. Say it out loud with me. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus. What does that mean? He is here referring to not when we were born only, but also when we were born again. What he's saying to us here is the day that you became a follower of Jesus Christ, assuming you have made that decision, God did something new in you that wasn't quite there before, something brand new. When we cast our faith in Jesus for the forgiveness of our sins, not only does he forgive us our sins, but he does something new and artistic and beautiful in you. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 reemphasizes this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, and the new is here. So when Adam and Eve were created uh, in the garden, um, they were made in the image of God. That's art at its best. But we know that they rejected the vision. 
They reject the vision. Sin enters into the veins, and they spoil it. It would be like pouring black paint on the Mona Lisa. So when Jesus comes, what Jesus does is that he restores us by faith. And not only does he restore us, but he installs something new and wonderful in us. Now the question is, what is that? For some of you, when you became a follower of Jesus, he put something new in you that wasn't there before. For some of you, what he did is he woke up something that was there all along that has not been used to this point. And for some of you, he took something that you already have, something he gave you when you were baking in the womb of your mother, and he's simply saying, we're going to use it for a different purpose. This is true. And so you have to ask yourself the question, what did he do for me? For me, I believe he did something new. So a little bit of my story. Uh, I grew up in an unchurched home, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, when I went to church at 14, I was very, very shy, very understated, very much blending into the woodwork, and very agreeable. About six months later, Roseanne's family moved to the church. The church is about 300 people on rally day and about 20 to 30 kids in the youth department. Really cool. And uh, Roseanne came to the church. She got herself a boyfriend, found herself having boyfriend problems. And someone in the youth group said to her, you should talk to Randy. And Roseanne said, who's Randy? There were only 20 of us in the youth group. She had been there for six months, and she still had no idea that I existed. Six months later, I found myself being asked to be the choir director of the church. Not the student ministry, but the choir director of the church. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory, shout the victory. Yeah, where did that come from, right? There's something, I, who is this person, right? And so uh, I got an office at the church at the age of 16. I think we might even have, I think I put the... Uh, the, the off, I, I've kept it over all these years. Do we have the picture of my... Of my um, no, we, don't, we didn't actually put that in. I actually have the picture. It says, Randy Frazee, choir director. I was 16 years old. And listen to this. I know it sounds like bragging, but I'll, I'll tell you in a moment what it really is I'm doing here. Um, the, the choir, in one year's time, went from 10 singers to 40 singers. And it was at that moment I realized that God had put something new in me to use for his purposes. I didn't ask for it. It's just there. Now, it turns out that my lead alto singer in the choir was Roseanne, and I felt it a need to have many private sessions with her to help her with it, particularly, you know, when a choir sings ooze, ooze. You get where I'm at with that? Yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, not only did I discover that God put something new in me, but I got the girl at the end of the day. Hallelujah, for sure. This is very special, but we have to ask ourselves the question, why? What was God's purpose for putting something new in you at the moment you trusted Christ? Well, Paul's going to answer that in the next verse. Let's put it on the screen. And say it out loud. Ready? Here to go. Together. So we can do the good things. So we could do the good things. He put something new in us so that we could spend our lives doing good things that make a difference in this world and make a difference in the lives of other people. But Paul really clearly here wants to clarify that you do not do these good things to earn a relationship with God. He made that very clear in the previous two verses, verses 8 and 9. For it is by grace that you've been saved, through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. 
The work we do doesn't save us, but expresses the purpose for which we were saved. Read that again. The works we do do not save us, but they express the purpose for which we were saved. I'd like to go back to the first phrase again, for we are God's masterpieces, and show it to you in the Greek language. In the Greek language, the word would be altoi gar esmon poiema. There's that word, poiema. And if you translated it literally into the English, it would be of him, for we are masterpieces. That's a little odd, isn't it? Of him, for we are masterpieces. That's because in the English language, we would have actually put this gar esmon poiema altu. Uh, for we are masterpieces of him. But in the Greek language that Paul used, when a writer wanted to express and emphasize something, they would take that word and put it at the beginning of the sentence. Right, Pastor? So altoi, what is he saying? He's wanting to emphasize that the work that is being done that creates you into a masterpiece had nothing to do with you, but it is all on God. He is the one who gets the credit. And so when you express what you've been able to do through God, you always are magnifying Christ. We should end with that song, Christ Be Magnified. Can you pull that off? Okay, we're going to sing Christ Be Magnified, but it's through our very lives. We are his tour de force, his piece de resistance, his magnum opus, the apple of his eye. The bottom line, we were created for purpose. We were created to do good things. We were created to rise above. We were created to build up, to not tear down. We were created to redeem and restore that which is broken. Remembering that we don't do all of this to earn a relationship with God, but rather we do it to express the purpose for which he saved us, for why we are here. Then Paul finishes the sentence with this shocking conclusion. I'm going to put it up. I'm going to ask you to say it out loud with me, okay? Here it is. Ready? Ready? Here we go. He planned for us long ago. What does that mean? He planned for us long ago. It means one of two things. It means either that God planned a bunch of good things that he wanted to have done in the world, then you were born, and then you were born again, And he has now decided to take some of those good things he planned long ago and delegate or assign them to you. Or it's even more severe than that. That he actually decided before you were born or born again the specific things he wanted you to do. He already assigned them to you before you were born. That should be a bit eerie to figure out, do you know what those things are? I would call your attention to the life of Jeremiah, the prophet. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 4. This is said of him. I'd call your attention to Acts chapter 17, where uh, the author tells us that God pre-planned, predetermined the places and the time in which everybody would live. You think you live here because it's beautiful. You think you live here because, oh, you have family here. You think you live in the house you live in because you like the walk-in closets. But God is saying, no, there's a bigger story going on. I have you here right now at this exact time for a reason. And a follower of Jesus wants to figure out what that reason is. What is that reason? God has us here for a purpose. He has things for us to do. And when we do these things as his new creation, We fulfill the will of God, and we also fill ourselves up with ecstasy. I have a new book coming out in May called The Joy Challenge, where I've studied the book of Philippians and extracted 20 principles on joy uh, from the teachings of Paul, either explicitly told by him or implicitly by how he was experiencing joy from prison. And then I compared it to modern neuroscience Yeah, and what we learn about modern brain science is that whenever you connect with transcendence, God, and whenever you daily live out a sense of purpose, your brain fires up in the most amazing way. Anxiety and depression flee, and love and joy emerge. That's what happens when we live in the center 
of the will of God. For some of you, it's going to be a big thing. You're going to, do, you're going to come up with the cure for some major disease, or you're going to live, lead a big company and employ many people, or, or lead an organization, or write a book, or do something humongous. But for most of us, it's something small. It's a series of small things, mostly about people, because that's what God cares about. Acts 17 says he put you here at this time and this place so that people would know that God is not that far away. You're an agent of God to remind them that God is near. Let me tell you a story. When I was, um, uh, I was in the Dallas-Fort Worth area for 22 years, and I got a call to join uh, uh, the staff uh, as a teaching pastor at a church in Chicago. And I was not only to be a teacher, but I was also going to lead everything related to spiritual formation of the people and moving people into community. This is arguably the most influential church in the back half of the 20, 20th century, uh, at least in the United States, without question. It would be the number one most influential evangelical church in America. The seating capacity, 7,200. The congregation on a Sunday morning, average attendance, 28,128. And I looked at Roseanne and I said, this is, uh, this is why God made me. He has something big for me. I'm going to go there and make a difference. Not everybody has this opportunity, but I'm going to do it. And I went there, and three years later to the date, Roseanne will tell you, we moved to San Antonio. It was very clear that we were supposed to move on, and it, was, and it was very clear that the work that I thought I was there to do, I didn't accomplish hardly any of it. And I remember saying to God, what was that all about? What was that all about, God? That was a big move. I thought there were big things. It wasn't right away, but later on, he said to me in that still, small voice, hey, Randy, do you remember that neighbor that lived four doors down from you on the other side of the street? Oh, yeah, Bill. He said, do you remember the day, because you had a relationship with him, that he came early in the morning and knocked on your doors and tear, your door and tears were strolling down his face? And he shared with you that the night before on a business trip, he had an affair and that he decided to come clean with his wife and she wasn't happy and you invited him in. And you said to him, listen, i got to go to work. But what I want to do is I want to tell you, we've been friends now for a while. I want to tell you, if you're really going to get through this, you may not get through your marriage, but if you really want to get through this on the other end, I need to tell you something. And I asked him to read the Gospel of John uh, about uh, um, uh, ha halfway through the day. He texted me on my Blackberry. That's when this took place. And he said, how many times was I supposed to read the Gospel of John? I said, just once, man, just once. He goes, well, I've read it three times. I called his wife, and I said, who had just become a follower of Jesus about two or three months earlier, and I said, I know this is very offensive, and I know that uh, I'm not going to push you to make the marriage work, but um, your husband, Bill, needs Jesus. And I said, would, it, would you be able to find it within yourself to have us meet at your house in the living room and to see if Bill's ready to receive Jesus? And she said, yes, that's big of her. And we sat around there, and I remember saying to him, okay, turn to John chapter 1 and verse 1. He's a graduate of University of Pennsylvania, so he's a smart dude. And he said to me, uh, what, what do you mean by chapter, and what do you mean by verse? I knew I was dealing with a newbie, right? And I said, well, the big letter is the chapter, the smaller letter is the verse. And I led him through the gospel message, and I said, Bill, would you like to receive it? He says, Randy, you remember how his wife, even after she had been so offended, put her hand on his shoulder and he prayed to receive Christ. And do you remember how two weeks later at this gargantuan church, you not only baptized him, but his wife and his two girls? I said, yeah, I remember all of that. He goes, that's why you were in Chicago. I said, you used me, Lord. You set me up for something I thought was big. And he goes, yeah, I did. How do you feel about that? I said, well, let's do it again. Let's do it again. In Ephesians chapter 4, two chapters later, Paul's going to tell us that he gave to the church pastors and teachers and, and others 
not to do the work of ministry. A lot of times you live with the perspective that, oh, oh, Pastor Sam and and others like Brandy, they're the ones who are doing the good work of the ministry. That's not what the Scripture says. The Scripture says that's your job. Our job is to equip you for the work of ministry, which means the work that God has given you to do here, inside of the church, and inside of this family, in this community, and around the world. And our job, Sam and Jade and Leslie, our job is to figure out why on earth has God left you here? Why? So let's talk a moment about application, and then we'll wrap up. We have a free assessment tool that we would like every single person to take, everybody, whether you're five years old or 92 coming up soon in the back. Doesn't look like 92 to me, but she didn't show me her driver's license, but I'm going to believe her. Whoever you are, to take what we call a shape assessment. Now, the word shape is an acronym that uh, stands for five things that we're going to be looking at to try to discover who in the world you are. Uh, first one has to do with spiritual gifts. That's the S. Then we're going to look at uh, your, your uh, heart. Which you ha- what do you have a heart for? Then we're going to look at your abilities, your passion, and then we're going to look at your experiences. And I think there's a QR code that's going to come up, and it may be in the program. I don't know, but there's a QR code and a link. You can download it, and uh, you can take this assessment, and we're going to give you from multiple angles. That you, and, you know, and you take this test. It's not that hard. And then basically, uh, step one is you take the assessment, and I think that we're going to put the QR code up. You can get your cameras out and take a picture of it. After you take the assessment, um, it goes to a very protected place uh, on our site, and we have what's called shape coaches. My wife has just gotten trained to be one of them. Step number two is we're going to invite you uh, to do a, I said one hour, but it could be less than that. It could be in person. It could be online. A one-hour uh, coaching session with a coach, a shape coach, to help you better understand what this thing might mean. And then the third step is the most exciting step of all, is that we're going to ask you, help you take your next step into God-given purpose for you. Amen? I love my church because we serve. I love my church because we serve. Now, the Scripture refers to the church as a family. And sometimes we, we serve outside of our shape, outside of our giftedness. For example, Roseanne and I are family, and she cooks a really wonderful meal, and at the end, there's mess everywhere. And uh, I go to her and say, "Um, it's not within my spiritual giftedness to help you clean up. And Roseanne, who is very fluent in sign languages, throws me a few sign languages that you might be familiar with, and she says, you get your butt over here and help me clean up. When you're a part of a family, you do things that are required to be a part of a family, but what we want, what Pastor Sam wants for you, is that you do the most what you do the best, that you might be able to find that thing for you, whether it's part of uh, what we do inside here of Yountville to make it what it is or what we're going to be announcing to you that we're going to be doing in the community or whatever it is that God has laid on your heart. That's what we're going for uh, in this experience. And that's why I'm here. I want to be a part of this. I want to see it all unfold. So let's put up... um, Oh, by the way, one other thing I would say. For some of you with the shape assessment and when you do the coaching, for some of you, most people need to serve because it's going to increase your joy. It's the second greatest catalyst for moving you along in your spiritual journey. But some of you, you may need a time of healing. You may need a time of growing up. And the shape coach would say, sit out serving for just a little bit and let's get you healed up before you do that. They will be mindful to do that for you. Amen? All right, let's put the scripture on the board one more time and let's say it out loud together. And then we're going to talk about Christ being magnified. Amen? Here we go. The whole thing. Ready? For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Father, we now hope that that everyone here believes you at your word, takes you at your word, and that we might discover why it is on earth you have left us here. We do know of the good works we get to do. It's because you have done this in us, and it is Christ who is magnified. 
So as we stand to our feet, Lord, we worship you for what you have done and what you're going to do in and through us and this church. In Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen.